Reading is just a habit you gotta form in all of life. Books don't change people's sentences. Reading good, solid, reform, Puritan literature, reading especially the classic, that's had the biggest impact on my life. Well, good day and welcome to another episode of the Reformers Bookcast, a podcast hosted by Reformers Bookshop. My name is Tom Eglinton, the manager here at Reformers, and today we are joined by Jonathan Williams. Great to have Hello, you on board, thanks Jonathan. for having me. Um, yeah, I'm glad to be here. Now, Jonathan, uh, we've got you on because you've authored this new book, A Practical Theology of Family Worship, which looks at Richard Baxter's timeless encouragement for today's home. Um, but before we get into that, uh, could you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, so my name is Jonathan, and uh, I've been married for almost 16 years now to Jessica Williams, and we have three lovely children. Gracie's the oldest, and then Silas and Elijah, and they're all still relatively young, uh, 12, 10, and 8 years old. Uh, I'm in Texas right now, which is where I've grown up. Uh, I grew up in North Texas. My father's a pastor, and so I grew up always, you know, gathering with the church that was all very familiar uh, to me. However, outside of the church, I was still, you know, living life for myself. And so I didn't give my life to Christ until I was 18 years old. And then very soon after that, while I had a man in our church discipling me, I believe God called me to ministry. And so now I've been in ministry for about 20, 22 years of my life. And that ministry has looked very different at times, everything from uh, being a missionary in the Amazon jungle to being a youth pastor, church planter. I pastored a church in Houston, Texas for 10 years. And currently I'm uh, serving as the director of a nonprofit ministry called Gospel Family Ministries. And I'm also serving as a professor at a seminary in North Texas, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. So that's a brief uh, glimpse into our life, our ministry, and uh, a little bit about my family as well. Thank you. Um, now, so you, you were in the Amazon as a missionary? Yeah, so pretty soon after I gave my life to Christ, uh, God started to quicken my heart for the nations, for missions, uh, this kind of great commission that we see in the scriptures. And so right after I graduated college, the Lord opened a door for me to serve with the International Mission Board. And I was on a team working in the Andes Mountains in the Amazon jungle, uh, trying to take the gospel to unreached people groups. And so I ended up being on a team with one other guy and a few other South American men in Peru, working in the Amazon jungle with the tribe called the Amarica 80. And so we did that for two years and, it, you know, got to really see the Lord pursuing families to the ends of the earth. You know, these little tiny spots in the jungle, these villages I've never heard of, and to see God's heart for those families, that he sent his son for those families, and uh, to see them saved and baptized and gathering as a church and worshiping the Lord after that, it, it was amazing. And, and God used that heart for the nations to eventually call me to pastor a church in Houston, Texas, that had 50 different nations represented in their church. And then God used that time of pastoring all these families to really quicken my heart for family ministry, family worship. And, and so even though my ministry over the years has taken on different forms, I see God's hand all along the way uh, bring me to where I am now serving in this ministry. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's fascinating. So you, did you have to learn the learn the language? You said these are unreached people groups. Are they... Were these tribes that have very little contact with the outside world? or um... So they, they have some contact, and some of the villages more contact than others. One of the villages had a road into it, so they'd been more exposed to the outside world. We were very fortunate, even though they had not been reached with the gospel, I would say anybody 50 years old and younger could speak Spanish as well. Okay. Now, they had their native dialect called Aracumbu, and so we would learn phrases and that as well. But we were able very quickly to, you know, start walking through the scriptures with them using Spanish. But they did, you know, back then I was way younger and I had a lot longer hair. And then the whole two years I was there, I never cut my hair. And so I had this blonde hair down to my shoulders. And they always called me Juanito, like Johnny Juanito in Spanish. 
But after being there for several months, we're sitting around the fire one night in one of the villages and a chief of one of the villages, he looks at me and says, Juanito, I want to give you a nickname in our dialect. I want to give you a rock and boot name. And I was so excited. And I just knew this is going to be the coolest name ever. And he told me, your name is Bunteri. I said, Bunteri. I said, I like that. I said, what does it mean? Does it mean, you know, anaconda, alligator, <laughs> thunder? It's got to mean something. Rainstorm, what is it? And he goes, no, no, no. He looked at my long blonde hair down to my shoulders. He goes, Bunteri is a caterpillar with yellow puffy hair. <laughs> and so my whole time as this missionary in the Amazon jungle, every time I'd introduce myself as Bunteri, they look at my hair and they just burst out laughing. Uh, so that, that, that was my uh, nickname, my identity there in the jungle. Oh, uh, that's too good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, God used it because... Uh, you know, when you're going into a village cold and they don't know you and you don't know them and you're clearly an outsider, there's always that kind of tension and that wall put up before they really welcome you in. But the second I said my name, all defenses were down. They knew he's no threat. He's a caterpillar. No problem. They <laughs> let us in. So it opened some doors for us, even if it was uh, making fun of me a little bit. Uh, that's so good. Um and so now, t- tell me about your the ministry you're involved in now um, these days. Yeah, Gospel Family Ministries. So that was, uh, again, you know, it was my heart for the nations, thinking I was going to go overseas again, that the Lord used my wife and I, our passion for that, to bring us to pastor, to bring me to pastor a church in Houston where we had 50 different nations. And so within my first year, though, pastoring that church, I found myself – I was meeting sometimes with 12, 14, 15 families a week. And they're telling me what's going on in their life, what's going on in their home. And you start to see a lot of sin, a lot of hurt. Uh, and it just, uh, I had this burden on my heart pretty quickly at that point. And I kept thinking, no matter what we do on Sunday mornings, no matter how healthy Sunday mornings is, I could preach the word. We're encouraging each other, praying with one another, worshiping together. If Monday through Saturday, these same families are just broken and struggling with sin and temptation. The question I kept coming back to is, are we really a healthy church? And the conviction that God then placed in my heart was we have to get the word of God into the home. Mm. And so this passion for family ministry really started to grow. Uh, That's when I went back to get my doctorate in family ministry and counseling uh, and started reading the Puritans and going to Richard Baxter for some of that encouragement 350 years after he wrote, still encouraging and helping me. And so along the way, when I was pastoring, I'd always preach through books of the Bible and we'd always have kind of a major theme from that book of the Bible that we focused on throughout the year. So one year I was pastoring there and I was going to preach through the book of Genesis and I'm looking in the book of Genesis and you see God's original blueprint for family, for marriage. You start seeing these broken families throughout the book of Genesis, the Lord's ability to redeem those broken families and still use them. And so this theme of the family was on my heart already because of the needs of our church. Studying through the book of Genesis, it kept coming up. And so that year, I told our church, as we preach through the book of Genesis, the theme I want you to hold on to, the the vision is this will be the year of gospel family. And the heart behind that vision was we, we have to be families that know the gospel, obey the gospel, enjoy the gospel, teach the gospel to one another in the homes even. And so throughout that year, as I was preaching through Genesis, emphasizing this family uh, focus for our church, the Lord put on my heart, I believe, to actually expand it to be its own nonprofit ministry called Gospel Family Ministry. I wrote a book that year called Gospel Family uh, that also focuses a lot on family worship. And so now, eight years later, that's actually kind of my main ministry. Our church uh, commissioned us a year ago and sent our family out uh, from being their senior pastor. After I shared my heart with them, they commissioned us to go and lead this ministry full time while also I teach at the seminary. So that's kind of a long answer to your question, but that's sort of the origin of that vision and of this ministry. 
And so, so what do you, what does gospel family ministries do? So our two focuses, because I never really worked with a lot of parachurch organizations. My heart is always for the local church. Yeah. And so when we went into this full time, my burden was still the health of the local church, the bride of Christ. Uh, so how can we be a blessing to the body? And so the two focuses that our ministry has is to one, come alongside local churches and according to their needs and where they're at, help them strengthen their family ministry in the local church. And then the second sort of pillar is to help cultivate family worship in the home. So this year, for example, we'll partner with about 12 different churches, uh, a lot of them here in Texas and some in Florida and other states. And we're going to help kind of cast a vision for family ministry, help create resources that would unify their different ways of their ministering to the families. Uh, a lot of times we'll do a big family workshop or conference uh, to sort of encourage that vision as a church. And then we also create resources to give to families that can help them start to live out what Baxter model, you know, family worship in the home, uh, whether that's family prayer calendars, family devotions, mission statement cards, family discussion questions, just trying to catechisms, just trying to get different resources that can help them get going. Because one thing that I've noticed and in, in, at least here in the States I'll meet people who've been in church their entire lives and they're my age. And I'll ask them, have you ever been a part of family worship? And they'll say, no. In right. fact, I was uh, speaking at a conference in Florida years ago. And at one point I was just sitting down with the men. There's about 30 men. And I asked them two questions. I said, first of all, how many of you have been in church your whole life? And actually to my surprise, all 30 raised their hand. All of them had grown up in the church. And so then my second question was, how many of you, as you're growing up, your family ever practiced family devotion or uh, family prayer outside of the mealtime, just thanking God for this food? Did y'all ever pray together or have a devotion together? And it was zero. Zero. And we were, yeah, we were actually having a conference where I'm encouraging them to lead in family worship. And I'm recognizing they've never even seen this before. Uh, So even if we can bring them to a place where they say, I see it in scripture. I see God's heart for this. I want to do it. We have to then be able to give them some sort of resource or help along the way. Baxter used to go into their house and actually just model it for them. And I think we still have that need today. Yeah. yeah. So is there, is there somewhere that um, us Aussies could access some of the materials you're, you're producing? Yes, please. Uh, we have a website called gospelfamily.org. And we try to put some articles on there, some other resources. We just uh, published a new resource on there this year. You can download in English and Spanish, a little PDF file on how to lead family worship and trying to make it very accessible. Just yeah. trying to look at what, what, you know, if you've never done this before, what are some starting points and trying to put that encouragement out there. Um, now I want to backtrack a little bit. You said that when you were pastoring this church in Houston, you would sometimes visit 12 or 14 families a week. Now, Mm. were you aware of Baxter at that point? Because that's a very Baxter idea that not, (laughs) I don't think many pastors do that, but. Well, in some of those visits, you know, meeting somebody for lunch or coffee or them meeting with me in my office, not all those were home visits like Baxter. And actually, so I wasn't aware of Baxter's home visits at the point that time. And actually I had to kind of wrestle with that because later when I started reading about Richard Baxter making 15, 16 home visits every week, this, he, you know, he was in the home of every church member every year. At some point I started feeling convicted, you know, can I do that? Should I be doing that? And then I looked at my context in Houston where you know, people don't get home from work till six, six thirty yeah, at yeah. night. If I visit one home, the next house could be thirty minutes away in traffic. And uh, Baxter's able to kind of walk door to door as many houses. Uh, but still, that that does that still challenged me as a pastor that he he saw the need to get in people's homes, break bread with them, and he saw the need and the value in actually modeling for them family worship instead of, you know, I think sometimes the church, we can be very good at showing the church what they need to do and even telling them why. And yet sometimes we stop short of actually modeling it, modeling that for them or kind of 
holding their hand and really doing the equipping work to where they're now able to do what we see in scripture. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Uh, I, Cause I had in my mind that you were <laughs> doing the full thing. I was like, that is very impressive. <laughs> I wish, I wish, I, you know, and that's the thing too is Houston. I, I would go do home visits. Oh, here's another challenge. Another kind of unique, you know, the church I was pastoring in Houston had 40, 50 different cultures represented well, some cultures, if they invite you over to their house, let's say 5 p.m., and you go for dinner, if you have another appointment that night at 8 or 9, that can be very offensive. Yeah, you yeah. know, if they invite you over, you're you're committed for the day. And so I think in that context, you have to spread out those home visits a little bit more than Baxter had to do. Yeah. So so let's talk a little bit about Baxter then. Um, so he's, what, 350 years ago, Puritan era. Um, who are his contemporaries? Yeah, so around that time, John Owen and John Bunyan, uh, not too far after Matthew Henry. Of course, he's 100 years removed from, you know, William Tyndale uh, and others, and, and even probably 40, 50 years, if I'm not mistaken, removed from uh, Richard Greenham and some of the other, you know, founders maybe of the Puritan movement. So he's coming a little bit later. Um, but J.I. Packer says he was a uh, Puritan thoroughbred, you know, that out of all the values that Puritans represented, he, he seemed to represent them uh, well, all of them together uh, throughout his ministry. Now, I often hear about Baxter that he has some interesting theology in some areas. Um can you maybe talk us through that a little bit and why why you still think he's worth reading, if you do think that, which you clearly do? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I know J.I. Packer, who's probably written more on Puritans than just about anybody else. Uh, I think he did his dissertation on Richard Baxter's views of justification, and uh, that book was then later published. And so I think during Baxter's time, you had some Puritans who – thought he wasn't maybe Calvinist enough. I know John Owen disagreed with him on several things. Baxter, you know, they call him a reluctant nonconformist. Uh, I think he kind of came later to that conclusion. Uh, he knew some nonconformist uh, pastors that he respected, and it was actually hearing the other side criticize them that made him start to think, well, I know these guys, and they're godly men. They're faithful pa- pastors. And so your criticisms don't really ring true. And so he starts to kind of explore the nonconformist side. I, I believe his ministry right before he went to Kidderminster, he, he was serving at another church and it was just enough removed from the big towns that he had more freedom in how he pastored and how he led worship. So he's able to get away from some of the expected things uh like doing the cross symbol when you baptize someone or when you serve the Lord's Supper. Some of these kind of what he considered man-made traditions, he he was already getting away from that, not because he said, I want to be a Puritan nonconformist, but just what he saw uh, fitting with Scripture, he, he was able to have the freedom to practice. And so I think he almost was just getting his feet wet in what we would call nonconformist views He also, you know, a lot of the Puritans held very tightly to the regulative principle. You know, unless we see it in Scripture, we're not going to practice it in worship. And Baxter almost was closer to maybe the normative principle, I believe is what it's called, where as long as the Scripture doesn't forbid it, then maybe you have freedom to practice it. So he didn't like, of course, I don't think any Puritan liked the term Puritan, but he didn't even really uh, grab on to the label nonconformist. Uh, he, he called his faith mere Christianity, hmm. which of course C.S. Lewis later borrowed and, and used uh, for his book, Mere Christianity. He got that from Baxter. And so I think that's where some of his uh, theology, people say, was it Puritan enough? Was it Calvinist enough? How come he didn't hold to the regulative principles tightly as maybe John Owen or others? And yet when you look at his pastoral ministry, you know, 13, 14 years in Kidderminster, what did he do? What did he preach? What did he write? How did he shepherd those families? I think you see Puritanism in its most beautiful sense woven throughout that ministry, and you can't help but be attracted to it. So when you, when you say that, when you say uh, you see Puritanism in its most attractive sense, what do you mean by that? Um, when you look at Baxter, what is it that you're attracted to? 
Yes, you know, he preached the word of God. In fact, at one point, he had moved uh, to London. And he left there in part, I believe his mom had just become ill and he's going to be home with her. But also he wrote uh, down that one of the reasons he left London is because he couldn't find any preaching there. Mm. He, he said he found a, a play, a stage show and, and on Sunday morning instead of preaching the word. And so he's seeing people who are kind of going through the book, a common book of prayer but they're not preaching these sermons. And one of the things that you see with the Puritans is this emphasis on preaching the word of God. Uh, And that's one of the things that attracts me to Richard Baxter is just his faithfulness to preach the text. I think that's why you can have so much written about family worship because he knew the scriptures. He's able to apply it to every walk of life. Um, Another thing with Baxter is he, he wanted to see that, reformation there in the english church he wanted to see what john knox was seeing in scotland he wanted to get away from those man-made traditions um and yet at the same time as he's doing that the word of god is there therefore what guides his ministry and so as the word of god calls him to discipleship to family worship to uh, meeting needs and pastoring families that's what you see him model uh baxter was constantly with his people shepherding them, meeting their needs. They had a time in Kidderminster, but they didn't have a physician, no doctors. So Richard Baxter became their physician for two years, not with a medical degree, but he just stepped in when he was serving in the civil war and they needed a chaplain. He stepped in to be that chaplain. He was constantly just meeting the needs of the people around him in a biblical way. Um, And then of course his writings, he wrote something about, 150 books, 160 books, depending on how you count them, uh, constantly reading, constantly writing. And all of this ministry, the the home visits, the pastoring, the emphasis on family worship, he's doing all of that while being very ill, very sick constantly. You know, the famous quote that we talk about with Baxter is he constantly would say, I preached as a dying man to dying men because he truly thought he was going to die. He, he had the ability of the nerves. He had uh, gallstones and kidney stones and nosebleeds. And he, he was thin and weak. Uh, there's a story about, you know, he was an avid reader, had books everywhere. And he's at his desk and he has this bookshelf above his head with all these books. And while he's writing there at his desk, the bookshelves collapsed and just the weight of all these books slam on his head. And he falls down. And that one story he thought he was going to die. Another time he had some stomach problems and he read some doctor wrote some medical journal article that if you swallowed a silver bullet, it might help with your stomach problems. So he (laughs) tried it and the silver bullet almost killed him. And so you have this man who maybe could have every excuse in the book to just be done and, and hang up ministry and retire and yet under the threat of prison, which later he's put in prison for 18 months, uh, uh, in the midst of all this sickness and illness, thinking he's about to die, he's just nothing but faithful. And then you see the fruit of all of that, and that alone, too, is worth celebrating. Yes, because the fruit was, um, if I'm not mistaken, that 800-odd families in his local town saved um, oh yes, right. and he's able to say none of them uh, had backslidden. Yeah, backslidden, and and then the going from many streets, no one was practicing family worship when he got there. And then, as Joel Beakey writes, by the time he left, there were streets where every family was faithful in their family worship. And even George Whitfield goes there, you know, hundred years later to Kidderminster, and Whitfield writes. A hundred years later, he still sees the fruit of Richard Baxter's labors. Wow. Uh, you know, what, what a testimony to what he had been a part of. And of course, we know it's the Lord who, who brings the harvest, uh, but he definitely, he surely used Baxter to plant some seed and water it along the way. That's great. And I know some of his works are being republished um, even today. And so they're mm-hmm. readily accessible, which is great. Um, now, let's talk about family worship. Um in particular, and what I want to, what, one of the things I thought was really interesting in your book, which, which is really a really good introduction to Baxter and his theology of family worship. Mm-hmm. So, if people are wanting to discover what he thinks, your book's the place to start. I think 
Um, and uh, but one of the things that stuck out to me was that he seemed to view the family as a as a unit, and that impacted how he came to the conclusion that everyone should do family worship. Do you, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's worth noting that throughout Baxter's entire ministry at Kidderminster, he was single. He, he did marry later, but it was after he left that uh, church that he had been pastoring for so long. So, you know, he, he writes that his singleness actually afforded him some of the extra time to do the home visits. Uh, meanwhile, though, he looks at his congregation, like you said, he, he sees families. And you and I were talking earlier, you know, we live in a very individualistic society right now where we, we don't act that way. And we'll even say things like, we'll say it's a personal relationship with the Lord. We'll mm-hmm. say it's my private, you know, prayer life. It's, you know, this is very personal and private to me when we talk about spiritual matters, instead of kind of fleshing that out and living that out in community, which is what Baxter, you know, en- encouraged. But one of the ways you see that is, Usually when we talk about family worship, we'll quote Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, the Shema, which is, I think, one of the foundational passages for family worship. We'll look at Psalm 78 and the example of this congregation making known the word of God to the next generation, the generation after that, uh, the call for fathers to bring their children up and the discipline and instruction of the Lord in Ephesians 6. And those are kind of our hallmark passages. Uh, But Baxter, when he is riding on family worship, he interacts with 50 different scriptures Mm. to defend apologetic, to provide an apologetic or to defend his, you know, position that family worship is God's will. And part of the reason why he's able to interact with so many scriptures is because like you said, he sees these verses that a lot of times we just apply to the individual and he applies them to the family unit or these verses that we apply to Sunday morning and he applies them to Monday evenings and Wednesday evenings. So he'll look at, for example, the one another's in the New Testament. We have, what, 30, 40 one another's. And we'll preach those on Sunday morning, confess your sins to one another, uh, carry one another's burdens, exhort one another. Colossians 3.16, this idea of teaching and admonishing one another and singing songs and praises together. And for whatever reason, a lot of times when we read those and study those and preach those, we apply them to Sunday morning. We might even apply them to when you're at work or talking to your neighbor, but something about coming into the home, we feel like, and that's where it stops. And so a lot of what Baxter's writing is just saying, you have to keep doing that in the home. You know, if it says pray together, pray together in the home. If it says teach and admonish one another, then do that in the home. We have very explicit verses that tell us to do that in the home, like Deuteronomy 6 and Ephesians 6. But then he's drawing from all these other scriptures and he even brings up the, you know, he anticipates the argument. Well, Baxter, how do you know those apply to the family? It doesn't say family. And he would respond, what makes you think it doesn't apply to the family? You know, show me the exempt clause where it says teach one another, except at home, pray with one another, except at home. And so as I saw the way he was kind of applying that scripture, all of a sudden it became, it seemed very natural to me as well. Yeah. And I think that's something uh, that the, the Puritans did quite well is reading, reading a text, not just taking from it, you know, the most obvious um, application, but, mm. but sort of thickly applying it across life in different circumstances, in different relationships. Absolutely. And, you know, you you have other scriptures where he's drawn from 1 Timothy 3 and this expectation that the elders and shepherds, leaders of the church are already doing these things in the home. And uh, I think we, we've gotten away from that. We, we've gotten away from being able to see that the Lord has a heart for family worship and that we see that woven throughout scripture. And now either we don't talk a lot about it or at best, we treat it almost like a take it or leave it discipline. Mm. That if you're you know, an elite Christian, maybe you'll families. do it. <laughs> yeah, maybe some families do it, but not mine, or yeah. maybe it works for you. Instead of saying, nah, this is imperative, we must uh, find ways to bring discipleship, worship, prayer into the home. Now, when most people, I think, um, if you said family worship to someone, um, if they have any idea what you're talking about, they might think of, um, you know, 
a half an hour in the evening where you sit down and you read the mm-hmm. Bible and you pray and you sing together. Um, and so it, is that family worship or is family worship a bigger concept than that? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, I, I think that is family worship. I, I do. I use family worship almost as a, an umbrella term that includes a lot of things, family devotions, family prayer, family praise. It, it can include even just spiritual conversations where you're discipling one another uh, in the natural rhythm of life. I, I think it also includes, you know, teaching catechism, some more specific things. So I would always say, and I think I might have put this in the book, that when I think family worship, I, I'm thinking about a Christian household that gathers together to pray for and with one another, to teach the word of God to one another, and then to praise the Lord together. Uh, Donald Whitney says family worship includes reading, praying, and singing. And and I think my definition is very similar to that, that you're praying together, teaching the word together, and then having time to praise. As far as what it looks like practically, I I think there's a lot of freedom there and it's going to look different for each context. Uh, You know, I, it's kind of like our personal spiritual disciplines. We find value in having that quiet time set aside in the mornings or evenings where there's no noise, no distraction. We're able just to, you know, sit in the presence of the Lord, pray and read our Bible. But we also understand that even when we're working and driving around, that we still want to maintain this sort of spirit of prayer. We still want to be uh, in the presence of God, praising him. And I would compare that to family worship that I do believe there's great value to sitting down in the evenings at the dinner table with the family, opening up the word of God, no distractions, reading the scripture, talking about it, praying together, sharing prayer requests and praises, uh, singing praises together. But I also think there's value in just the natural rhythms of life, uh, finding ways to seek the Lord together. You know, for example, when you're picking your kids up from school and you're driving home, have some spiritual conversations. When you're on a family hiking or hunting trip and you're out there in, in the wilderness together to be able to look for ways to point their heart to the Lord, or if they're going through a hard time to pray through those things and talk through those things. Cause you're also trying to cultivate this biblical mindset, this biblical worldview. So I think family worship takes place both the set aside times and the natural rhythms of our day. Yeah. I think that's really helpful because, um, because like you, I mean, take the car example, for instance, you've got, you've got drives that you do all the time. And mm. when you dump your kids in the car, you've got a captive audience. They can't go anywhere. They, <laughs> you know, and so you can, you can do, you can do things, and you can utilize that time really well. Um, and it's and it's something that we're just doing all the time. And we usually, we usually just put something else on or some music or something to distract them. But, um, oh, yeah. but we can really redeem those times. So it's helpful, I think, to think about it in that that way. Of it's it, it's got this overarching. Uh, concept mm-hmm. and I, I certainly found that um, came out as I read your book. Mm-hmm. So that's helpful. Well, I think uh, I know a lot of families today. One of their initial objections to family worship is we we feel like we're too busy, yeah, and, and that we don't have time. And one, I, I think we we probably do have time, and there's going to be times where we have to sacrifice certain things, maybe you know, watch TV less or cancel this one activity. So there might be times where we have to make a, (laughs) (laughs) maybe, I said maybe. (laughs) So, but you know, we might have to make a little sacrifice of the schedule. But one thing I always share with families is if you want to cultivate family worship in your home, perhaps it's less about adding something extra to your schedule and more about adding intentionality to the yeah. things that are already there. Yeah. Like you're saying, we already have time together in the car. Let's be intentional. We're already going to eat dinner together tonight. Yeah. Let's just be a little bit more intentional with that time. And little by little, I think we can really grow in our family worship. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Like what if you read a Psalm before dinner? It wouldn't ta- yes. take you hardly any time at all and just absolutely would add something significant to your life. Yeah. Um, now you mentioned you have three kids who are sort of hitting that late, well, coming into the tween years. Um, mm. Has 
has, thinking just about that sort of structured time of family worship, has that always looked the same in your family as you've sought to live this out? How has it shifted? What what sort of do you have any practical tips for people trying to do this? Yeah, it, it's it's not looked the same at all. It changes all the time, and so I think my best practical encouragement would be to show yourself a lot of grace. You know, I, I think sometimes we can become very rigid when we want to practice something like this and we have this expectation that, okay, it's going to be every night at 6 PM. Everybody's going to be quiet while I'm reading the Bible. Everybody's going to <laughs> engage the conversation. And, and, and then we get very frustrated when, you know, you're trying to read and a kid spills their milk or something happens or the doorbell rings. And so I think just showing yourself grace to say, we're going to be intentional. We're going to fight to have this in our home. We, we value it that much. And yet it's going to look different depending on the night, depending on the age of the kids. There, there's a point where we had a newborn, a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Family worship looks very different. You know, you're trying to put it on their level. You're having to be patient with a kid who's maybe crying or needs a diaper change. And so it can be very loud and messy and uh, static even at times. But as they grow up, you know, now you have some maybe more opportunity for longer conversations and more engagement. But then also as they hit the teenage years, a lot of my friends tell me, that's when maybe they're not as involved as you would like them to be, or they give one word answers to your questions. And so I think just showing yourself grace, uh, what we don't want to do is be discouraged and say, well, we tried, it didn't work. It was too hard. I don't think there's ever a place for that. And so we see it in scripture, we see the value of it. And so I think we fight to have it in our home but then we have to be very flexible and very gracious with one another to allow it to fit our family's context at, at that age, at that stage. Yeah, yeah, no, that's where I think too the the Puritan concept of seeing the family as a little church and the head of the home mm-hmm. as seeking to to minister to and pastor that little church um, is helpful because you know the a, a pastor of a church doesn't really have an option. They have to rock up and minister the word every week, right. regardless right. of what's happening in their congregation, um, regardless mm-hmm. of whether or not they think it's working. You know, God God promises right. to work through these these means, and He doesn't always do it in our time. Um, oh, absolutely! In fact, there's one night my uh, kids were younger, and we're about to sit down with dinner, and I wanted to have a family devotion, but I was tired. Honestly, I was thinking maybe we'll just skip tonight. So we sit down at the dinner table and we're eating and finally I was like, all right, I'll, I'll read something. So I opened my Bible and I read something and afterwards I might have asked one question. Then I was done. I was checked out, honestly. And then my daughter, though, she asked a question about what we had read. And then my son, Silas, he asked another question. Then Gracie, then Silas. And my wife's answering a little bit. I'm answering a little bit. And at one point, it just occurs to me, the spirit impressed my heart. I'm looking at these two kids in this conversation and I saw the, the Lord's doing something here. And so now I'm engaged and we're talking, we sit there for maybe another 30, 45 minutes talking through their questions and the scriptures. And my oldest two kids that evening, Gracie and Silas both gave their life to the Lord. Huh. And like you said, it's, you know, the Lord uses it. it. You know, what does Peter say? It's the imperishable seed. And Isaiah is going to accomplish what the Lord set it out to accomplish. And so if we could just be faithful sowers to actually plant the seed and water it, the Lord will bring about a harvest. And so that was not my best family devotion. That was not the night I was most engaged or prayed up, ready to go. And yet that was the night the Lord, you know, saved the hearts and saved my two kids. So my oldest, my third one, my youngest, he gave his life to the Lord while we were reading John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress. So Beautiful. just another little shout out to the Puritans there. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a wonderful story. And I think that's as, as good a place as any to end. Um, so thank you so much for your time, Jonathan. Thanks for writing the book and uh, for your work in encouraging people in family worship. Thomas, thank you so much for having me on. And uh, I'm a big fan of the podcast and I really appreciate getting to be here. All right. And you've been listening to the Reformers Bookcast. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and we will see you next time.